Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Today, we're going to look at there's more in the area of your fitness. Everybody say, woo! Everybody say, fitness. Nobody likes to talk about fitness. But we're going to talk about fitness this morning. <laughs> and uh, the, the foundational scripture that we're looking at is from Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the third chapter, and the 20th verse, where it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ever ask or think, according to the power that works in us. God wants more in every aspect of your life, not only in your faith, not only with your finances, but also in the area of fitness. But there's another passage of scripture I really want to draw your attention to, and it's from Romans, and it's from the Message Bible. In Romans, the fifth chapter, it says, there's more to come. Do you have that up there? Whoa. (laughs) It's messing up. Let me just read it to you. It's in your notes if you have your app. But it goes like this. It says, there's more to come. Now, the context of this particular passage has to do with tribulations and trials and all the turmoil and all the stuff that takes place in our lives from time to time. He goes, in the middle of all that stuff, there is more to come from God. He goes, we continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how patience turns or forges this idea called integrity into our soul. Patience is a good thing. And it's through the trials, it's through the the hard times that he uh, formulates patience on the inside. Then it turns into integrity. And integrity, if you do it right, man, it keeps you alert and it keeps you in a position where you are uh, expecting God to do something in the middle of your trial. A lot of times we want to get out of the trial, but God works right in the middle of your trial with something beautiful. It wasn't until they were in the middle of the sea that all of a sudden God began to move. It wasn't until Abraham was about to uh, lay down his life upon his son Isaac. It was in the middle that God came and provided a ram for him. Does that make sense? So in the middle of it, uh, God wants to do something for you to expect him to work right in the middle of it. He says, in alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. There's not enough stuff. There's not enough containers that, that you can hold on to that God doesn't want to pour something inside of you that you need and you and your household needs. There's more. A little bit later in a couple of chapters of Romans, the eighth chapter, and again, in the middle of all the trials and stuff, he says, you and I are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You're more than a conqueror. I don't feel like a conqueror. I know you don't feel, you don't look like one either, but you are one. <laughs> you are one. Amen. A lot of times I don't feel like it, but all I have to do is get in God's words like, oh, this is who I am. This is how I feel, but I am not my feelings. Positionally, I've been given authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt me. Are you out there? One clap. That's awesome. Come on. Listen, this is the beginning of the year. You can't act like the end of the year. We're just in January right now. And so he has something great for you, more in the area of your faith and also in the area of your fitness. Now, before we go on, I need to explain what fitness is because when people, fat people don't like to talk about fitness. Okay, let me just be honest with you. How many fat people we have in the house? Man, I'm surprised. What the heck? It's a bunch of y'all like me. But let me explain what fitness is. First of all, fitness definition is this. Quality of being suitable to fulfill a particular role or task. You have a task. You have a role. You have a mandate from heaven, a purpose to fulfill here on this earth. You as an individual, you as a family as well. And God wants you to fulfill it. But many of us are unfit spiritually, unfit mentally. Some of us unfit physically that we can't fulfill what God wants us to do here on this earth. I remember asking the Lord just a few years ago. I said, Lord, I'm ready for the next mission. What's going on? What's happening here at Crossroads Church? I need to get and prepare myself so I can prepare the people, blah, 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 prepare the leadership. And he says, I can't give it to you right now. Why? Because you're unfit to fulfill it. (sighs) Jeez, thanks, God. What do you mean? So I had to evaluate. I had to look at myself internally. In other words, what he was saying, he goes, the quality of your spiritual condition, the quality of your mental condition, even the quality of your physical condition, you're not fit to fulfill what I need you to do here in the, in the near future. Need to make some adjustments. So I had to. In military terms, it's called you're unfit for duty. Unfit to, and for duty, there's various aspects in the military that they qualify you as unfit for duty. Some of it, some of you guys, we just can't make the physical, uh, the fitness test, the basic fitness test. 
But there are others that have come out of war, and they're also wounded. And they're not ready. It would be a bad thing for them to go right back into war. So they're mentally broken, and they need some time to heal. Some of them are wounded physically, and they're not ready to go back out. They have to let that wound heal. And so it is in our lives as well. Now here, let me just put some, some softness and some ease to you. I'm a pastor. Okay, I'm a pastor. I'm more concerned about your soul. I'm more concerned about your health and the area of your soul and your spirit by, than I am about your physical portion, even though that's very, very important because it's, we're in this body for a reason, to fulfill God's plan and purpose for our lives. So I'm not going to cast, you know, stones at you because we're all fat. Fat, fat people, like I said, don't talk about fitness. As a matter of fact, skinny people like to talk about fitness. Fit people like to talk about fitness. And fat people want to destroy, you know, fit, fit people. They want to give them black eyes. They want to just sit on them and just stay there for a while. Right? Like all the fat people are like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Reminds me of a joke with little Johnny. Little Johnny came home from school and he had two black eyes. Yeah, oh, little Johnny. And dad looks at him and goes, little Johnny, I told you to quit fighting these little boys in school, when you're in school. He goes, Dad, I promise it wasn't my fault. Seriously, it wasn't my fault. We were all in chapel, and we got up from prayer, and they told us to stand up. And my teacher was in front of me. And when she stood up, I saw that her dress was stuck in her, in her behind, in her bottom. And it didn't look comfortable, so I pulled it out. And she turned around and hit me. And I got one black eye. He goes, little Johnny, you can't be doing that to women. He goes, you've got to stop doing it. But that's just one black eye. What happened to the other black eye? He goes, well, my friend Levi was sitting next to me. And I saw that he didn't, the teacher didn't like what I did, so he just shoved it back in. <laughs> it's hilarious. Anyways, uh, here's what I know about all of us. Some of us are walking around here in this space, bruised and back, black-eyed, because we're not minding our own business. Because we're poking around in other people's business and not taking care of our own business. Some of us have stuff stuck behind our tail and those of us who have friends that love us are trying to pull it out or make us aware of it, and we're getting upset at them. And we're unfit in various areas of our lives. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. Many of us are unfit emotionally or soulishly or even physically, and some of us spiritually. Because how do I know that? Because I talk to a lot of people here throughout the week, week after week, month after month, and I see evidence of it. And here's some of the evidence. Have you ever been more focused on the inner critic in your life rather than the inner voice? You pay more attention to the inner critic. You're not any good. You're doing this again. He's just constantly damning you and condemning you and shaming you. And that voice becomes more stronger and more, more, more stronger in your soul than the inner voice of your spirit. He goes, hey, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You ever been out there? How many of us have ever been in a place where we're worrying, 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 about the stuff that possibly could happen rather than what Jesus has done that's already happened. Are you out there? What Jesus has done determines who you are as a follower of him. Unfit in these areas will absolutely shatter your life, your personal life, your business life, every aspect of your life. It'll shatter, it'll have shattering effects. It's kind of like the drug addict that doesn't recognize that he's in, he has an addiction. Well, many of us as Christians, we're unfit. We don't recognize uh, and we, we deny the inner contradictions that are going in, on in our own soul. And we just keep walking as if though nothing's wrong. But there's more for us in every aspect of our lives, specifically today in the area of our fitness. And this whole idea of spirit, soul, and body and being ho holistically whole as a follower of Jesus, it, it has a domino effect. In other words... If you pay attention to one thing, it also can have a chain reaction in other areas of your life. If you have a strong spirit, usually you have a person who has a strong spirit, they usually have a strong mind, a strong emotion, strong will. And they also are in a position to tell their body what to do rather than allowing their body just to crave the appetites of the flesh or yelling out. It's like, you know, yeah, I need that. I need, let me have a double water cheeseburger. <laughs> Whatever you call that. Water burger cheese, which is, that's what it was. Backwards. Sorry. Are you out there? A strong, if you're physically weak, a lot of times when you talk to them, because there's, they're only operating in 25% or 30%, they're physically weak. A lot of times you'll see it translate and have a chain reaction. They're also mentally weak. And if they're mentally weak, they are uh, quitting, and they're not even paying attention to any of God's word that they know is inside. And so we are going to look at this idea, whether we like it or not, in the area of fitness, because I know that God has more for every single one of us here in 2020. 
23. And you don't have to take big, giant steps. It's just little baby steps. Little baby steps. It's like drifting. You ever go to the ocean and you put all your stuff here and you're out there swimming. And when you look back, it's not there anymore. Why? Because you, you drifted a little at a time. You get off course. Well, just as much as we get off course, we can get on course a little at a time. A little at a time until we were right there, smack dab, right in the middle of God's will. So let's begin here in Matthew's Gospel, the 22nd chapter, where it says, Jesus is talking. And he said, <clears throat> Jesus said to him, love the Lord your God with all your, with all your, and with all your mind. Three aspects. You know that you are a spirit. You have a soul, but you live life on this earth in your body. We're a triune being. And the scripture right here says the love that you have for God should translate into caring for your spirit, caring for your soul, and also caring for your body. When you think about Jesus, though, you didn't see Jesus in scripture going to the gym in Jerusalem, doing all these reps and all this stuff. You don't see that in scripture, but what you see in the context of the New Testament is what he did with his body. A lot of times, Jesus just walked. He walked everywhere. He didn't have a weak body. He had a good, strong body that had a bunch of stamina. He walked up hills. He walked down mountains. He walked to Jerusalem. He walked to Emmaus. He walked by the shores of Galilee. He walked constantly on and on. He didn't run either. I never saw one passage where Jesus ran. As a matter of fact, when I looked at all of it, it's like the only thing you saw Jesus running around him was demons. They were running away. They were running into pigs. They were running over cliffs. But Jesus just walked constantly. You know, Joel and I went to the Jesus Trail. We walked uh, 40 miles, 10 miles a day, and uh, we walked the very steps where Jesus walked, 10 miles a day, up hills, up the Sermon on the Mount, and it was physically, you know, challenging. And so he had to have a good, strong body. And what he ate, what we ate back then was probably similar to what Jesus ate back then. He didn't have pork chops. He didn't have bacon. He didn't have water burger with bacon. He had different stuff, goat cheese, eggs, fish, lamb, every now and then, greens, olives, herbs, all that kind of stuff. People are like, Ugh. it's good for you, hummus. When we were there, we were eating all this stuff that I wasn't used to. It's like France. When we went to go eat at France, I ordered a burger, and they brought me this burger. Literally, it was like this big. <laughs> and I said, no, I asked for a burger. Because that's not, he goes, here, this is your burger, sir. I don't know how they talk, but this is your burger. I'm like, that's the burger? That's like eight bucks for a burger? Let me have six of those things. <laughs> Anyways, but what did he eat? He ate good stuff. And what did he do with his physical body? You know, he wasn't measuring his body based upon a chart. Hey, you're five foot eight, you're six foot one, you're supposed to be weighing this. What he did with his body, he served the mission that God had upon his life to fulfill that mission. He healed people. He taught them. He loved on them. He embraced them. He encouraged them. And I knew that Jesus was strong. You know why I know that? It's because there was other strong men like Peter and different folks that followed him. And usually strong men don't follow weak men. He was a strong man. He was a masculine man. But he took care of himself in every aspect. He had a strong physical body full of stamina. He also had a strong mind. And he had definitely had a strong spirit. First Timothy, the fourth chapter, it says, body training is beneficial. It's of some value, but it's of value. But godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life that is to come. And a lot of times we put emphasis on body, 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 and that's great. We have to have a good physical body so we can fulfill the purpose of God. But we also have to understand that godliness is profitable into all things. And it carries not only into this life, but also in the life to come. You notice that many of the temptations you find in Scripture have to do with food or have to do with the appetites of this flesh. In the very beginning... He was tempted with something to eat, and they gave in to that temptation. A little bit later on, you see Jacob and Esau, when he was tempted with uh, bean soup. He traded his birthright for a bowl of soup. Jesus was there operating in the, in the wilderness, and it says he was tempted. He was fasting 40 days, 40 nights. He was tempted by the devil. The temptation, one of the temptations that came is that, hey, turn these stones into tortillas, no, into bread. If it would have been tortillas, he probably would have ate it because Jesus was a Mexican. Just saying. <laughs> Proverbs 23 says, if you're a person that's constantly giving yourself to the appetites of your flesh, he goes, put a knife to your throat. If you're a man given to the appetites of your flesh. Joseph was telling me, he says, Marcus, he goes, it's not that hard. He goes, man, 90% of fitness has to do with your, with your intake, with what you're putting in. You just can't be putting that same stuff inside of you. 
drink a bunch of water, make some adjustments here and there. Ricky Van Pay was a great, great friend of mine. He, uh, he would come, and he, he actually has a calling now to help pastors throughout the country, help them get better in their physical body. And he notices that the chain reaction takes place. When they're stronger physically, they get stronger mentally. And they also get tr- stronger spiritually. And they're able to do more for the kingdom of God. But he had this thing called four tyrants. He goes, let me just strip it down and make it real simple for you. For those of you who are struggling or for those of you who are wanting to get actively involved, you've made some resolutions. No condemnation here. But basically he says, look, just move. Move, lift, fuel, rest. Just move, man. Just start walking. Lift, do some kind of strength training. Pick up your dog, pick up your wife, pick up something. Just pick up something. Just have some, some strength. Do some kind of strength. So do a push-up or something. And then watch what your intake is, fuel, and rest. Make sure you get good sleep. He goes, and you'll watch yourself get stronger and stronger in your physical body. Does that make sense? All right, that's enough, enough of that stuff. Let's talk about the soul. This is my passion, my soul, and my spirit. Your soul consists of your mind, your intellect, your emotions, and your, your will. Third John, the first chapter, says it this way. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. Because if you want prosperity in your life, you have to make sure that you don't neglect your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions. If you ever uh, hang around Natalie and I long enough, <clears throat> you'll notice this phrase that we say often. You've got to fight to keep your innocence. One aspect of having a strong soul or a healthy soul or a fit soul is to um, have an innocent behavior, an, an innocence uh, in your outlook of life. In other words, living life with wonder and amazement, with creativity, with imagination. We do ministry out of our imagination. We don't do it out of our routine. Religious people do things out of routine. But those who are followers of Jesus, they should be doing things Jeremiah creates out of his imagination. The Spirit of God put those things inside of him. And he's, he's leaning heavily upon those things. And God's bringing a great work and good work that's coming out of that because he's, he's leaning into that aspect. <clears throat> but that's important for us. Your mind, your will, and emotions should be healthy. Our will, we should be disciplined enough so that we're not looking at the worst in people, but we're looking at the best in people's lives. Our, our, our emotions, we should be able to laugh and look at stuff that happens in our lives with the innocence of, of a child. You ever notice why kids are always laughing at the, some of the craziest things that you're mad about? I'm like, oh, why are you laughing? This is not something that's not funny. They're like, I love you, Daddy. I love you, Popo. It's like, you're grounded. Okay, okay. It reminds me of this story with these two boys. They put them in a room and it was full of manure. It was a pile full of, I was going to say something, but there, it was full of manure. You know what that is. <laughs> and the first one was like, eh, he's getting all crazy. He's crying. So they had to take him out of the room. And the other one, they couldn't find him. Well, he was in there. He was like diving in there, just going crazy. He goes, boy, why'd you do that? He goes, with all this manure around here, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. (laughs) And living your life with innocence is just looking at the bright side. It's living your life with wonder and amazement. I took Elias, my grandson. He's four years old, baby. Is that right? I took him. That was my duty because Natalie was gone. The parents were gone in Florida. So Popo, they call me Popo whenever they're elementary. When they turn into teenagers, they call me the Pope. And so (laughs) he said, hey. Popo, your assignment is to go take Elias to his soccer game. And I'm thinking, man, I'm already in mind, I'm already in playoff mode. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna get him, put his cleats on, I'm gonna put his stuff on, I'm gonna kick the ball, I'm gonna have him kick before the game, pregame stuff, I'm gonna warm him up, and I'm gonna get him all psyched up. He's gonna go kick the ball, he's gonna make a goal today. And so I picked him up, I took him out there, I was like, Elias, are you excited? He's just laughing, just not even thinking about the game. And then I got him a little psyched up and stuff. And so we're about to take him onto the practice field, the pregame warm-up stuff. And right when we're going onto the field, he goes, Popo, I got to go potty. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> you should have done that at home. Where's your mother at? <laughs> Anyways, I had to walk all the way around. It wasn't like a few steps. It was like way, all, way, all the way around. I'm already sweating and stuff. I'm like, forget it. I got him back. The game's almost going to start. And I start pumping him up again. And sure enough, the whistle blows. <laughs> And they take off the kids, and I'm excited to get, to get a, a, you know, a score. And these kids are running around, kicking, and doing all this kind of stuff. And there's Elias picking up the dirt. <laughs> picking up the dirt. He's going around, sh- chasing his shadow. And everybody's going back and forth. And I'm like, Elias, get focused. Get, kick the ball. Go to the ball. 
And because he was doing it, other kids started following him. So you got a train of kids <laughs> following their shadows, picking up dirt, and, all, and then they're, they're kicking the, the goal into the, the opponent's, you know, side. They're making the goals for the other team. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. And the, the coach is even like, yay, good job. It's like, no, it's not a good job. What's wrong with you? And then I began to think, it's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Marcus, are you crazy? And I was reminded of this passage of scripture in Mark's gospel, the 10th chapter, where it says, listen, to the truth I speak, whoever doesn't open their arms to receive God's kingdom, like a teachable child, will never enter into it. So live your life with innocence. Don't ever lose your innocence. And as we get older and older, we have a tendency to lose our wonder and our amazement and the joy and the beauty that God has put right before us. Isn't that the truth? <clears throat> but not for Nikola Tesla. For those of you who don't know, he was an amazing inventor. As a matter of fact, some of you guys ever plug in your Android or your iPhone? Even just a few days ago or a few minutes ago or a few hours ago. Well, he was the one that invented this whole idea of alternating current. And uh, the reason why you have those outlets is because of this man right here. But there's a story behind this amazing genius mind of this gentleman. Mr. Tesla, whenever there was a thunderstorm, he was known to get a sofa and put it in front of the windows of his home. And he would wait for the thunderstorm. And when lightning would strike and when it would it just roar, he would stand up and he would applause God. He's like, man, that's beautiful, God. He'd sit back down and he'd wait for another thunderous noise, another lightning would strike, and he would get up and he would applaud God. Bravo to God. He never lost his wonder. You had a genius, lowercase g, standing up and giving a standing ovation to the capital G, genius God Almighty, with applause. He never lost his wonder, but he was a genius and a brilliant mind. Isn't that a beautiful um, thing to have? Just for the record, there are 2,000 thunderstorms at any given time here on this earth. At any given time, there are 100 lightning strikes per second. That translates into 8.64 million lightning strikes a day. And according to Psalms 29, after every single one of them, the angels say, bravo, God. Bravo, God. Read it. Read passage. In Psalms 29, you'll see how the angels applaud at the wonder and the beauty of God. Here's my point. When's the last time you cried or clapped for your creator? When's the last time you gave God a standing ovation or a sunset for your spouse that God's given you, for the laugh of a child, for the pastor who loves you? When's the last time you applauded God for who he is? Turn to your neighbor and say, fight for your innocence. Our soul has a tendency to lose its innocence. <clears throat> and an unhealthy soul will eventually become critical, suspicious, and guarded. Anybody ever know anybody like that? We have a tendency to get that way. Natalie and Kim, our administrator, she's right here, they did a dangerous thing yesterday. They went shopping. They went uh, junking, what they call junking, in round, round top. That's when they have like three miles of junk everywhere. It's awesome. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And so Natty came home after all day doing that. She came home, and she's all smiling like she always does. She goes, hey, honey, I was thinking about you. I bought you this gift. And she gives me this gift. And it's a gift of a little donkey with a container in the back. And she goes, isn't that beautiful? And I'm thinking, what the heck is this? container she goes isn't that awesome she goes this is a toothpick holder it's like oh and then she looks at me and she says what were you I said what were you thinking when you gave me this it's like I was thinking that you're such a hard worker and it just reminded me of you and and I was like she looked at me with this crazy eye she goes why what do you think I was thinking now I, I was embarrassed to say it, but I said I was like I thought you, you were thinking that I was an ass <laughs> <laughs> if we're not careful we'll have a tendency to become critical have a tendency to become suspicious, have a tendency to believe lies that the enemy tries to come and throw in our lives. Does that make sense? You know, I read this quote this last week. It says, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Isn't that the truth? In other words, the emotions that we experience don't reflect the external reality. They reflect the internal reality. Let me put it this way. Matthew's gospel, the sixth chapter, Jesus says it this way. Your eyes are the windows into your body. And if you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. 
But if you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dark cellar. And if you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you're going to have. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like that. I read a portion of a poem by Elizabeth Browning this week. And the poem goes something like this. Earth is crammed with heaven. Do you notice that? Earth has a bunch of beautiful things that we can be in awe about. Earth is crammed with heaven. In every common bush, there's a fire with God in the middle of it. But only he who sees will take off his shoes. The rest will just sit around it and pluck blackberries. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but man, that just struck my heart. In these last days, Jesus said in the Gospels that you're going to be betrayed, you're going to be hammered, all kinds of trials, people that you love are going to betray you, they're going to persecute you, they're going to do all kinds of evil against you. And here's, here's the admonition that he gives us. In those moments, make sure that you possess, in that place, make sure that you have endurance and possess your own soul. Be disciplined enough to fight for your wonder, fight for the amazement that God has birthed inside of you when you were born again and received him as Lord of your life. There's more in the area of fitness in our lives, in the area of not only physically, but also in the area of our mental health, and specifically in the area of our spiritual health. Let me just talk about that for just a second. Your spiritual strength, some of you guys want to grow spiritually. Your spiritual strength is directly connected to your love for God's word, period. You want to grow spiritually? You cannot grow spiritually with a 30-minute message on a Sunday morning. You need daily bread, daily bread. As a matter of fact, he trained them. God trained his people every day, look to me for sustenance. Every day, look to me. But we're satisfied in this 21st century with just a 30-minute message. I'll come back and get some more. No, we need to be directly involved. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Proverbs says if you faint in the day of adversity, you will recognize that your strength is very, very small. And the problem that we have um, is that what I hear a lot is the Bible's boring. I don't understand it. The Bible's so predictable now. You know, it loses its drama. Every single time I read David and Goliath, David always wins. So why read it again? Every time I read that Jesus is raised from the dead, he always is raised up on the third day. Every time I read about Peter in the boat, he always is the one that gets out and walks on water. And, and, that's, and that's good, but here's the solution. We need to stop reading the Bible and start meditating in the Bible. Reading in the Bible gives you the width of understanding. But meditation in God's word gives you the depth of understanding. And it's important for us to go from just reading the Bible to allowing the Bible to read you. And so when you're reading David and Goliath, Put yourself in that story. Become the stones that he picks up. Become Goliath as he wants to destroy the one who God's put his hand on. Become the brothers who were jealous of the brother. Become the dad who was waiting for a report. Become, put yourself in one of those aspects of the story. Meditate upon it. When you meditate upon scripture, two words come to mind. One is murmuring which is just speaking. You ever see me moving my lips and I'm not saying nothing? It's probably because I'm murmuring, I'm reading, I'm thinking about a passage of scripture and I'm just meditating upon the passage. Another word means ruminate, which is most of us know it by chewing the cud, which happens with cows. Cows have two stomachs. And whenever they eat green grass or grass or whatever they're eating, they eat it, but they don't digest it all. It just goes into one stomach. And then they regurgitate that. And it comes back up and they keep chewing and chewing. I know that's, uh, sorry, babe. It's lunchtime almost. But it comes back up and they chew and they digest it to get all the nutrients, to get all the stuff that helps them, that's good for them, and it goes into their second stomach and somehow or another it comes out into white milk. Milkshakes. Banana splits. No, I'm just kidding. All right, sorry, let me get out of here. The solution is to meditate. Joshua says it this way. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Why do we meditate? So we could prosper? No, we meditate so that we can become a doer of God's word. It's the doer of God's word that becomes prosperous and successful in every aspect of his life. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.